Globus. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for this session. As we all know, trade has become a very troubling uh, issue uh, in global, um, uh, global geopolitics and, and economics uh, in light of what's been going on in the United States. Uh, so what we thought we would do in this panel, together with a very distinguished uh, group of people, uh, is to have uh, perspectives from ac academia, business, and government uh, with long, long years of experience uh, talk about how the world trading system is evolving, uh, where the business opportunities are, uh, and then uh, where uh, the feedback will work politically among all these things going forward. Uh, so let me thank our very, very distinguished panelists for joining us today. You can read their, um, uh, their uh, uh, bios in the, in the little book. I don't want to take uh, any more, uh, more time uh, than necessary introduction. So let me just begin uh, with about five minutes or so. Uh, on the issue uh, of where international trade agreements are going. Um, we've seen uh, the uh, trouble with the TPP. We'll see what happens next. Uh, but uh, where do you think things are going? If I can start out with uh, uh, Dr. Solis. Um, Solis, excuse me. Um, where are we going um, in terms of uh, multilaterals, bilaterals, um, uh, who's going to be in, who's not going to be in? Uh, where do you see the, the direction of trade agreements going? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that it's a pleasure to be here. This is my first time at the G1 conference, so I very much appreciate the invitation. It's been very refreshing to see the robust back and forth that takes place in this session, so I'm sure that we're going to have that mm -hmm. uh, this afternoon as well. So uh, you ask a very important question, and I think I would start by saying that even though we know that there is indeed growing skepticism about globalization, even though one of the first actions of the uh, President Trump was to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Initiative, that does not mean in any way that the trade agenda is dead. Far from it, I would say that there is indeed a very active pace of negotiations. And I would say that what's interesting to watch for is that, in my mind, what we see is the United States going in one direction and many other countries that have been close partners of us going in a different direction. So we have to think about that, perhaps, at growing divergence. Why say this? Well, um, the first action, as I just said, was to withdraw from a ne negotiated trade agreement of the magnitude of the TPP. This is a very important milestone, or a line has been crossed, if you will, because the United States had never failed to ratify a negotiated trade agreement. So this creates tremendous doubts uh, in the minds of our prospective trade partners uh, when they think about sitting at the negotiation table with the United States again. But the other thing that this administration has launched on, besides withdrawing from the TPP, is to reopen the NAFTA trade agreement and to ask for changes, perhaps, to the core trade agreement. So this administration is starting with, if you will, looking backwards, trying to change the terms of those existing trade agreements. And those negotiations are going to be very tough. I would uh, make the case here, we're in Tokyo. Well, you should perhaps, if you want to understand US trade policy, watch very closely the NAFTA talks. That is going to be the first signal of what an American first trade policy looks at the negotiation table. It's going to uh, be a very interesting process because not just what these three countries are negotiating, but I think one of the most active negotiations is taking place inside the United States between the incoming administration and then Congress and the business community and so forth. So that's one uh, direction that the US government is taking. Whereas countries in Asia Pacific, actually, where we still feel very strongly that multi-party mega trade agreements are the best option because of the economic and the geopolitical benefits that they generate. And there are a number of important initiatives in the table. One is a regional comprehensive economic partnership, which uh, uh, economic agreement, which you know has been in, under negotiation for several years. Large economies in the region are part of it. But those negotiations have proven very difficult to wrap up. There are divergence of views on the level of liberalization. And I would say, and I can expand on this, but I want to be uh, too long on this, that what the RCEP, the Real Comprehensive Economic Partnership, suffers from is a leadership deficit. And that's why the negotiations have not wrapped up. Then you have the very important agreement between Japan and the EU. Just a few weeks ago, a political agreement was reached 
And I would say that in Washington, people are not paying enough attention to that agreement, but that's very significant because of the size of the markets, but also because it's a high ambition uh, trade agreement. And it does signal that leading economies like the ones in Europe and uh, Japan are still very much of the persuasion that trade liberalization, ambitious trade liberalization is the way to go. And then finally, you have the TPP-11, which uh, is very interesting because, again, many people in Washington rushed the conclusion January 23rd that the TPP was dead. And I think this reflects the fact that many people in the United States cannot think that an ambitious trade agenda can go forward without the United States. And it will be very interesting to see if indeed these countries can pull this together. It would mean that countries in the region are moving on uh, without the United States now. The goal is, of course, to bring back eventually the United States. That's going to be long left. And I can discuss later what I think would need to be done. But this would actually put Japan really in a leadership position uh, because Japan, as the largest remaining economy, will have to play that role of, of, of securing that agreement that keeps the level of liberalization high, but nevertheless accommodates the petitions from countries like Vietnam and Malaysia who say, well, this is a different deal because the US market is not at stake. Okay, thank you very much. May I now uh, ask uh, Minister Hayashi, uh, in uh, light of your long experience in trade with the TPP negotiations inside Japan, uh, but also as a former uh, defense minister and economics minister, uh, what is your perspective of what's going on in trade now? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Robert. And what I felt, and also I read uh, recently a few books about uh, what's going on in the United States, such as Hillbilly, Elegy, like you did, and also another book called The uh, Archives by Robert Putnam, uh, who's very famous for uh, Bowling Alone. And I really realized with these figures, uh, Gini call e efficient. The 1990s, US, Britain, France, Germany are almost at the same level as 0 0.29. And zero is most equal, and one is most highly uh, different. So in these 25 years, US and Britain goes from 0 0.29 to 0 0.36. Uh, radius at the 2015, but actually France and Germany still stays almost the same level as 0 0.29. So when I found these figures in this January, I thought maybe Macron might win the race, not the Le Pen, and that's what actually happened. So I found what's in what's what's the number in Japan, and I found that Japan is 0 0.32. So just in between the 0 0.36 and 0 0.29. So that told me that what happens in that, those books that our kids and hillbilly elegies, it resulted in these numbers in the macro wise. So um, what happened in that election, uh, two elections, uh, Brexit and US place elections, based on these figures. So, uh, we cannot escape from these realities that the most of the people regard that free trade is the reason for these kind of things. Actually, I'm not, I, I don't think that's the real reason, but so what, I, what we have to think is the how to make people realize about the fact that lead distribution or society 5.0 type of things is the real question to be solved, but not free trade. Free trade is to gain more values, but the value has to be in each country redistributed in uh, due process. And that due process might be very important to get back uh, the backdrop for, not against, but for the free trade. So that's my first comment. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Nakatsuka-san, may I ask you, uh, in this context, with a different number of different kinds of trade agreements coming along uh, with the need uh, to balance trade and distribution, et cetera, how will Japan uh, maintain uh, competitiveness uh, for Japanese-produced products overseas? How can we maintain employment here in Japan uh, in uh, this kind of trade and political environment? Okay, thank you. Uh, before talking about that, whenever I exchange business card today, everybody asks, what is JATCO? J-A-T-C-O, my company, Japan Automatic Transmission Company. 
It's a global number two transmission company in the world. Um, if you drive Infinity, Nissan, Mitsubishi, Suzuki, fair chance that you are driving my transmission. But anyway, <laughs> go, coming back to uh, your question, Roby, um, you know, my company has a big plant in Mexico. One third, sorry, 30 percent of my production done in Mexico. Naturally, those Mexican produced transmission going to US market. So if something happens to NAFTA, it's going to be a significant implication on our business. But having said that, I'm trying to be away from that discussion because as a private company, whatever happens to trade agreement, we need to comply with that. And we will comp compete by giving uh, you know, direction or giving environment. So what I ha we have to do as a corporate is, as Hayashi-san exactly mentioned, bring value to the customers. How we can provide values how we can give values to the end user. That's what we need to think about. So we may need to think about a new logistics arrangement. We may need to think about where to produce, et cetera. What, that's what we will do. But at the end of the day, what I'd like to say is, what is good for the end user? What is good for the customer? That's, as a corporation, I need to think about. That's my quick response. Uh, in the uh, negotiations on TPP, were you involved in any discussions about what to do? Uh, with uh, the uh, auto parts? My company, yeah, company no, yeah. absolutely not. Uh -huh. uh, we're carefully and uh, silently watching what's going to happen. <laughs> so I understand auto parts are going to be a very interesting uh, element in anything that happens in US Japan uh, going forward. Um, let me uh, move on uh, to uh, the, uh, the next uh, issue, if I may, and ask uh, uh, both yourself and then also uh, Hayasan about um, Japanese markets and uh, what is open, what's not open, where are the opportunities going forward. I'm uh, quite impressed with how different Japan is today from in terms of open markets than it was when I first came to Japan uh, in 1970. Long time ago. It's almost 50 years. Can you believe it? Shh. Okay. Um, Orange juice was like, what, 10 bucks for a glass. And now you can get orange juice cheaper in Tokyo than you can in New York. So things are very, very different in terms of some kinds of, of market opening. Uh, but actually, there's still more to be done. Uh, in some agriculture, a lot in healthcare, a lot in education as well. Uh, so Hashan, if I could start with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, the government is doing in education and how that might affect trade in uh, education services? Yeah, before, before I go into the, the education, I briefly would like to touch upon agriculture because I was an agriculture minister too. And actually, when I started the negotiation, not with the United States, but negotiation with the party, our party, and it, it, almost it's impossible, but actually step-by-step -step approach was very successfully achieved. The first before TPP, we go with the uh, free trade with Australia, and beef was the key issues for that. But uh, we can match with the uh, EPA with Australia with TPP, and we could see that the Japanese beef market is 40% domestic, and remaining 60% are shared all, almost all by Australia and the United States. So for Australia, before TPP came in, they don't have to, be, have to get the final answer, right? So they need something a little bit superior to the situation of the United States before the TPP really starting. So that's what we are trying to do, and actually I think we could do that. And that will uh, enhance the TPP process itself, but also very importantly, enhance the understanding of the party side. Party side means Japanese producers. And actually, after Australia EPA started, actually almost no damage to Japanese producers. So that's kind of immunization, Yobo Chusha. And everybody knows that Yobo Chusha is you know, king itself, right? And small amount. So that thing's really worked, and that's the beginning of the change here. Even, so 1970s are a little bit different to talk about, but the 90, or, uh, 2 or 10, mm -hmm. it started the, the, the change. So back to the educations. Uh, when we are kids in the school, there's very strict uh, wall between the inside of school and outside school. And Anybody who can stand in the classroom should be the teacher. 
But now I found out, you know, getting to this ministry, any, many kind of people, you know, English teachers or club activities teachers like baseball, and also school counselors. And now we are trying to get the lawyer too, for maybe not inside the school, but they can still give the advice to the teachers. So that is now what's happening at the school. So actually, it's like agriculture's you know, situation uh, started in 2010. Education uh, front is also becoming really open. So could be some uh, you know, interesting talk for uh, free trade for education. I don't know, but uh, 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 you know, classroom is really changing. That's what I feel. And who is harder to negotiate, the Americans or uh, the LDP? In back in 2010? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both. And actually, uh, I was really uh, made good friends with the uh, USDR uh, Froman, and we sometimes met, met, and they're having a hard discussion with the Europe, um, especially with GI. So I, I made him a joke that the U also have a very good uh, GI in the United States, and he asked me what. So I said, Kentucky Fried Chicken. So, but uh, oh, nobody funny. Uh, GI <laughs> is a geographic <laughs> indication. So I should talk about that. But, but you know, it's very tough. But also that's the dealing both sides at the same time. So if you miss the timing, it's really suicidal. And now you have to deal with the teachers' association. Ah, uh, everybody says that, uh -huh. but actually, we as a ministry is not in a position to deal with them. Actually, each prefectures and uh, uh, many times uh, also the uh, mayors and all those uh, level are uh, the real employee employer for the teachers. So actually, uh, there's no such nikyoso and monkashos uh, fight. Nowadays. Oh, uh, okay, very good. Nakatsuka-san, can you comment a little bit about um, a Japanese market opening uh, and what, what you see happening there, if anything? Yeah, if it comes to auto industry, it's already opened. Uh, zero percent duty when import you know, cars to over, from overseas countries. But if we, when we export uh, the automobile, we have to pay like uh, US 2.5%, China 25%, Europe 10%. It's still there. However, having said that, Japanese OEM historically for the last 20, 30 years promoted localization. So the, that kind of the duty arrangement is not that a big issue at this moment. Therefore, uh, you know, we, I love status quo. If it comes to free trade agreement, of course, more open market. You know, you, we are in a discussion with the EU for the EPA agreement with EU countries. That will be a, a opening up or reduce the uh, tax for uh, automobiles and plus automobile parts. That will be a plus. But it, since Japanese automobile companies already promoted localized production in European countries, that impact is not that big. Therefore, I, we welcome. We welcome any free trade agreement. And we welcome any you know free trade and reduced tax duties, etc. But you know that's not going to be a big issue. And the more big, big, much much bigger issue is a mega trend in coming to uh, auto industries like you know EV, autonomous driving, you know connected cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's going to be a much much bigger issue from my perspective. Do you think there's a need at this point to create common standards for electronic vehicle parts and that that might help trade? Is that happening or not happening? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, make to, let me make that answer quick. Japan you know, built very tremendous supply chain in the past. Toyota supply chain, Nissan supply chain, Honda supply chain, etc. So they have different platform. There are no common sharing of the parts or technologies versus what's happening in the US or China or European, they are a kind of consortium going on between among you know industries, you know, the colleges, government institutions, etc. So for Japanese standpoint, to compete with that kind of mega trend, we need more collaboration. That's my personal view. And that's going to be applied to EV as well. That's my view. Thank you very much. Let's move on uh, to a somewhat related but important issue, which is the tension 
uh, between um, multilateral and bilateral uh, trade agreements. Um, uh, in the post-war system, multilateral agreements were thing, the best thing. They got harder and harder to do. I have a little um, uh, theory that the difficulty of the negotiation goes up uh, with the square of the number of countries involved. And now we have 150 countries <laughs> involved in this. This is not going to be easy. So what happened next, of course, is regional agreements and, in some cases, bilateral agreements. Uh, Mireille, what do you see going forward in terms of FTAs? Uh, are they a creative way of evolving trade agreements? Uh, is bilateral better than multilateral? Multilateral, uh, uh, regional, better than overall? How do you see that issue evolving, particularly uh, given what the U.S. is doing now? Sure. Um, you know, I think that the starting point is to note that the multilateral trading system has faced a stagnation at the negotiation stage since 1994. It has not been possible to close the Doha round, but for all practical purposes, the Doha round is dead. And that has to do with the challenge of having 150 plus members agree on a deeper integration agenda. And, you know, the legalization of WTO also means that these agreements bite, and therefore many countries at very different levels of development are just not prepared to go forward with a single uh, undertaking, a single package. And governments have adapted to that by negotiating preferentially. And you have the bilateral option and you have the regional option. We hear now in Washington, coming from uh, the Trump administration, that the uh, best choice is the bilateral route. And I think that the argument they make is that this clarifies the calculus. It's easier to know what the cost and benefits of the negotiations are. And you know, also the fact that the United States is the largest market out there, and that should give you advantages when you negotiate one-on-one. -on -one. I actually believe that bilaterals are not the best way to go in general. And I would start by pointing out that the United States came to the TPP because it was actually quite aware of the shortcomings and the limitations of the bilateral route. The first trade policy that the United States pursued in the region once it went outside of WTO was mostly on the bilateral uh, track. And therefore you have agreements, say, with uh, Singapore, with Australia, and so forth. But it was also very difficult to wrap up some negotiations. The ones with Malaysia, for example, they came to nothing. The ones with Thailand. So just being the largest market does not guarantee that you're going to get your way in a negotiation. Trade agreements must depend on the agreement in both parts. And uh, you know, so the, the risk of these bilateral trade agreements is that they take a very long time to negotiate if you go one by one. They tend to generate idiosyncratic rules, rules that just apply to the two countries. It's very difficult from there to think you can build a larger regional architecture. And they're built in transaction costs. Because basically, you're telling your exporters that they have to learn and work with, say, 13, 14 different type schedules. And there, of course, the rules of origin that a lot of paperwork so that you can enjoy the benefits. Whereas in a multilateral regional setting, you take care of those inefficiencies because something like the TPP has cumulative rules of origin, and therefore you can attend to the needs of the supply chain. Um, and then the, the markets combined are much larger, and it has also been shown that countries are prepared to make larger concessions at the negotiation table if they're thinking about the larger pool at stake. And therefore, that's why you can get more liberalizing outcomes if you pursue uh, the regional uh, track. So um, you know, I think this is where we are. I think that the United States now faces the risk of exclusion from the regional architecture because the bilateral route is not yet taking off. And uh, some of the things that they're putting on the table in terms of trade philosophy, you know, uh, trade seen in a zero-sum way, is obviously not creating a lot of confidence from prospective partners to come to the table. What about the aspect of bilaterals in Congress? I've heard that it's extremely difficult to get bilateral agreements through the US Congress because there are just too many little US vested interests involved. Columbia US agreement is an example. Could you comment on that as well? I think, it, yeah, uh, it's broader than that. I think that uh, trade has become very difficult for American body politic. And it's going to be difficult if it's a bilateral or if it's a, a regional. And I think that we have to understand that you know, the backlash against trade agreements started really after the NAFTA negotiation. You had support in the Democratic Party decreased markedly after that. And uh, you know, just uh, to give you an example, trade promotion authority, which is necessary for uh, these agreements to have a fighting chance of ratification, 
Uh, the last time the vote took place, only 28 Democrats voted for uh, trade promotion authority. So very difficult to bring the Democratic Party. And now the questions also are about the Republican Party because that support also seems to be eroding. And the question we have in front of all of us is how we make uh, trade liberalization work in the domestic political system in the United States. Hi, Arsene, may I ask you? Um, trade uh, agreements seem to be easier to get adopted in Japan than they are in the United States. Nowadays? The, these days, yeah. Why is this? What is different about American and Japanese politics now that makes trade agreements easier to adopt in Japan? I think one of the reasons is uh, the point I made at the beginning. I think uh, more difference between the, the group of the people resulted in you know, they need something to attack on, and the, the you know the, the campaign of the uh, current president utilize the free trade as that scapegoat. So now the group of the people who are staunchly supporting the current president is really believed in that. So actually, that is shown to the congressional. Uh, situation like Miriasan uh, explaining about. So that's why by uh, our side is really specific program. Automobiles, free trade already, machinery, strongest. So only few areas like agriculture, maybe pharmaceutical, and for the future maybe education could be that. But specific approach is more easier than the overall issues such as in the United States. So that's why we could, we could almost overcome the agriculture issues almost in, in these five years. So that makes our position more stable. Uh, we have no big allergies to the world free trade as in the United States politically. Nakatsuko-san, may I ask you, um, when you are trading uh, from your Japanese or Mexican factories, uh, is the administrative burden of having very different rules for different countries, is that a major element for your business? Not at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very you know, standardized. Mm -hmm. So no you know, uh, issues in dealing with different countries, different criteria, et cetera, very little. And that's probably because you're in a, uh, an industry where ha that has called standardized uh, parts and standardized uh, sort of uh, rules about the way things have to operate. Yeah, and probably the reason is promoted localization, more local you know, production for long decades. So I think that's why we don't have any trade issues these days. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, let me move next uh, to a sort of related issue, going back to what uh, Maria said and some others. The role of China. Um, China has taken a stance now that they're pro-globalization, wonderful speech by President Xi at uh, Davos a while back. Um, my sense uh, is that um, the survival of the Communist Party in China uh, requires uh, the globalized system to continue. So of course they want it uh, to, to keep going. Um, how do you see uh, trade relations with China evolving? Um, and then what happens when the internal dynamic in China, and where there are issues of populism and income inequality, et cetera, how do you see trade with China developing? Right? Um, well, I'm going to appear super critical of the current approach of the United States on trade, but I would start by saying that an America first trade policy is the best PR campaign that China could get and for free in the sense that, you know, uh, it's now much easier for China to occupy that space and to make the argument as President Xi did in Davos that China is not going to play a role of champion of multilateralism. And it's true that China has stepped up its uh, international economic diplomacy, but I would say that on trade, China has not been on the leading edge. Uh, you know, China has not been playing a very proactive role, and I think this has to do with the fact that leadership in trade is particularly exacting, is very demanding, because at the end of the day, if you really want to champion free trade, you must find the political will to open your market. And uh, you know, China obviously is ex extremely well integrated in the supply chain, but access to the Chinese market is a different ballgame. And when you look at different indicators as to how open the Chinese market is, then you immediately run into figures like you know, the applied tariff in China is something like 11%. The equivalent in, the, in Japan is like 2.4% or something like that. 
And then you have OECD statistics that show the product market index, which really measures how open or not an economy is. Well, China obviously has a much higher uh, level, not only compared to other OECD countries, but to also emerging economies. So, you know, China is not uh, uh, very much willing to negotiate on those issues that are not just about the tariff. And the tariff is really the instrument of protection of the past. I mean, in some instances, and we know that for Japan in agriculture, that was a central focal of negotiations. But by and large, when we look at what different trade agreements can make, we're talking about non-tariff barriers. So we're talking about disciplines on state-owned enterprises, protection on investment, intellectual property, liberalization of services. The agreements that China is mostly prepared to undertake are not those that are going to be most uh, ambitious in that sort of agenda. So that's why I don't see that China can really become this uh, uh, you know, very outspoken champion of free trade. It can indeed you know, uh, uh, be a champion of multilateralism because the United States is creating a vacuum. It's sort of saying we're not going to be on board with multilaterals. And that's the, the, the free right that they're getting, I think. Nakatsuka-san, how do you view China in the auto uh, trade globally? Obviously, it's a large growing market, yep. uh, but where do you see China and, and autos affecting global trade? Yep. I think, do you know how big is China market versus Japan market in terms of the automobile sales? It's 5x. So a huge percentage growth in China has a you know, much, much, much bigger than Japan's sales growth. So I mean, China is such an important market, and we have a big factory in China as well. And you know, if it comes to you know, free trade, I don't see any issue, and because China's growth ratio overrules everything else. So you know, there is a tar still tariff uh, to you know, export to China market, but you know, the, all the OEMs promoted local production so by forming a joint venture with Chinese local uh, players. Therefore, the, our key is that how China is going to implement new policies if it comes to automobile, like EV ratio, X percentage by year 2000, XYY. That's going to be a significant you know, implementation, uh, implication on the total global you know, automobile businesses. So the trading standpoint, like uh, you know, rules or regulations and compliances, etc. we are not seeing today a big issue in, in doing business with China. That's the state of the China today. Okay. And Hayashi-san, may I ask you, one of the uh, characteristics of Chinese uh, mm. growth, uh, based on exports, based on state owner price, et cetera, has been a huge, huge worsening of income distribution inside China. Do you see that as a political issue that will affect the way China approaches trade? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think uh, since we don't actually know that how many incidents are actually happening every day in China, and some says almost 10,000 a day is really make a demonstration against the government, but nobody actually knows. So what we know from what we're talking about our Chinese friends is they're trying to their utmost effort to make more redistribution. And also the big issue is, is in between the city dweller and local dweller. And local dweller used to be treated as a foreign guest labor in the city side. So that issues are really one by one mended so still, that's a big difference between those people in the lower economic status and higher economic status. But actually, I think this is their kind of uh, destiny because when they started that we are trying to introduce some market salaries, and market salaries resulted in that, you know, the income inequalities. So. And seems like they are trying to make a good balance between the redistribution and economic growth. And what I see uh, for them, uh, the next agenda, is to how to overcome their middle income trap. And see, back in the education side, actually the educations at the higher level, like universities, and also how many he in your long uh, referred thesis numbers, they are now increasing in numbers. 
So innovation is actually happening in the Chinese model of the mixed economy. So actually this is a very new model. We've been saying that this won't happen in China because that's not free market system. But actually government led it's happening. So I think uh, we have to be very carefully watching what would this system would result it in. In DACA side, it's still a big difference and many people are claiming. But on the brighter side, innovation is happening. It's really a big mixture, I think. Yeah, it's particularly difficult for, uh, for me to figure out. As I'm trying to look at the development of China and see how it works, compare it to Japan, it's quite interesting uh, to look at some similarities between, say, the Zaibatsu system and then the, the large company system in Japan, which in a way were sort of similar to SOEs. Not owned by the government, but a lot of control. And it was very hard for Japan to dismantle that system in the 80s and the 90s. I think China's going through a similar sort of thing. But the difference, of course, is Japan had a democratic government to allow um, opinions and feelings from the bottom to get to the top a little bit easier. It's harder in China. And that, I think, is one of the issues that we're going to have to Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good point, that actually democracy reduced the cost of making those development, actually, because the uh, government has to pay a lot to the owners if there's no change of government, no democratic process, so that they have to keep their legitimacies by making economic growth and also heavy compensations. And those issues never actually finally resolved. So, so if they really you know, realize that situation, they might think about that. But still, I think that's a very big country, or, or almost continental. So maybe our nation state concept might not apply to that big continent. Very difficult. I think we're a little bit beyond the topic of trade here. Uh, <laughs> so if we can. Um, Nakatsuka-san, let me ask you, uh, as you see the world uh, sort of progressing, how do you think Japanese businesses should prepare for a world that has a, a very complex set of multilateral, bilateral, regional, uh, and then geopolitical changes? Uh, for example, the, the possibility of secondary sanctions by the United States against uh, states that deal with North Korea. How do you as a businessman keep track of what's going on? <laughs> and how can Japan um, navigate in these difficult uh, seas? Yeah, I think you know, it's pretty difficult you know, to predict what's going to happen. So what to, as a company we can do, what we should do is to make our you know, action very quick enough Mm -hmm. And because I'm in the industry which requires a huge investment, I'm not in an internet company, and when producing the automobiles or transmissions, it requires a very, very big investment. So we need to make a smart investment, wise investment, need to where and what and how, and make you know, payback period shorter than before. That's what we need to think about. And the second thing I can say is to work with others, external mindset, and work with partners, customers, even suppliers, you know, to share information, to cope with challenges, work together, because what you can do by yourself is kind of limited. Therefore, I think we need to tie up with other guys, and it's not just mean a uh, Japanese partners, you know, in you know, global partners, we need to tie up more with those guys. That's what I think we should do. Yeah, I think one of the smartest things I saw Japan do over the history of the 70s and the 80s was respond to uh, the American so-called voluntary uh, restraints uh, by investing in a lot of different places all around the United States. And by doing that, they created a, a set of, uh, call it Japan supporters, or free trade supporters in many, many states around, around the country. My home state of Tennessee is a perfect example. Uh, Japanese companies employ something like 50,000 plus people in Japanese factories just in the state of Tennessee. If those uh, factories disappeared tomorrow, uh, the unemployment rate in, inside Tennessee would go up probably something like two percentage points. So Japan has a lot of friends uh, because they invest. Uh, in the book that uh, Minister Hayashi mentioned, Hillbilly Elegy, there's a wonderful example of how uh, the steel company in Ho Ohio was about to shut down. Uh, a Japanese company came in and bought it. Uh, for the first couple days, there was lots of, you know, anger and what's going on here and we're getting bought out by the Japanese. And then two or three days later, everybody realized, hey, we still have jobs. That's not so bad. 
and things calmed down very quickly. So I think what Japan did during that period is also perhaps an example for how to um, spread the benefits of trade around and create a political basis uh, for free trade. And another very good example of this is the very different positions historically that have been taken by uh, President Trump and Vice President Pence on the issue of trade. Uh, Vice President Pence has been one of the guys who thought TPP was a really good idea. And he has a very large Toyota factory in his state. This is not a coincidence. If we may, let, let's move on a little bit more. Yeah, all politics is local. That's what I learned from the Kennedy School. But also, uh, you know, uh, now m m maybe we could, we we've been sticking to the GDP too much. And another figure is G&I. And gross national income includes all the investment return from abroad. So that really shows what type of added value we are ma actually making. If the Toyota factory is making automobiles here in Japan and export to the United States, that's in Japanese GDP. But if that factory moves to the Tennessee and making cars over there, but still returns something, that increases the return here while making employment there. So maybe if we see GNI, maybe that issues might be more easily conceptual. I would go one step further, but it would take us too far off, uh, off track. Um, the dog doesn't contribute anything to GDP, but a great deal to welfare. And so we have to think about that too. One final topic before we go into Q&A, uh, which is the issue of trade and geopolitics. Uh, the Trump administration has now come up out with the idea, sort of a, a threat, uh, that countries that uh, trade with North Korea could be cut off from the American market. Okay? Uh, in a certain sense, um, you could say that, well, if you're going to be part of the world trade system, you also have to be part of the world security system, since the United Nations has said that the North Koreans should stop. If you're trading with them, you're not part of the system. Okay? So you can understand the logic there. That said, is it really good, uh, a good idea to connect geopolitical issues or uh, security issues with trade issues? Good idea or bad idea? Right. Well, in that specific example, certainly a bad idea because it's absolutely uh, not realistic, right? The United States economy would suffer tremendously if it were to decide to cut off trade with any other country that trades with North Korea. So it's not really doable and it actually would come and hurt the American economy. But to some extent, geopolitics and uh, trade negotiations are linked and uh, they are linked in very different ways. And some effects can be quite positive. If you think about some of the initiatives that have been put out by this administration and were walked back because of the geopolitical consequences. I'm thinking about uh, you know, the steel investigation, the Section 232, the idea that you would restrict steel imports out of national security considerations. You know, action was expected much sooner. That decision has been postponed. And a large part of that, I think, is because of the concern that this could have in uh, uh, national security grounds in uh, uh, aggravating relations with our uh, partners. And the other example more recently is the Korea-US trade agreement when there was a, a somewhat of a tweet uh, out there saying that maybe uh, the United States would uh, withdraw from our chorus and again the pushback from the uh, point of view of the geopolitical consequence of doing this in the midst of a worsening situation in North Korea very quickly uh, uh, help dissuade the president not to do that, at least not for now. Very good. Hi, son, may I ask you, as a former uh, defense minister and economics minister, what is your view of the rela relationship between trade and geopolitics? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I remember, hearing to that question, I think I remember the book Cold Peace. I think uh, after the Cold War, actually this is a Cold Peace, and actually, when China emerges as this big size, maybe I, I could feel like if you can beat them, join them. So if China mix with geopolitical and trade, then if we theoretically separate, it's just like Japan in 1990s that uh, multi WTO is the only way. But other countries started to do bilateral, regional, and we are almost the last country in OECD to start the bilateral with Singapore in 1990, 1999 or 2000. So, if so, if you can, if somebody can really set the rule that trade issues 
has to be separated from other issues. Then we could abide by that law, but law are sometimes non-existent. So if you still have to be competitive, you have to take a balance between joining that you know, bandwagon versus pulling that bandwagon to the way that should be. So at the end of the day, the, uh, the, what's happening every day is the mixture between, a mixture or good balance between two. My apologies for asking an unanswerable question there. <laughs> Nakatsuka-san, do you have any um, uh, comments uh, being no, no, caught no. between the two? No. Please don't include us. Okay. <laughs> please, please, please. Exactly. <laughs> Stay away from that kind of the, you know. The itabasa no yamete ne Don't sandwich us between this nonsense. Okay. Thanks very much. We're at the uh, time to start Q&A. Do we have uh, questions? Please, yes. Thank you, Dr. Feldman. Uh, my name's Wang Dong and a professor at Peking University. Thank you for your comments in the earlier session. Very, very thank you, interesting. Thank you. I really appreciate it for inviting me here. It's my privilege and honor. Um, I enjoy very much this fascinating uh, panel discussion. And especially, I think I uh, appreciate and res well, respect uh, the very deep understanding and insight about China. Um, the Hayashi, Minister Hayashi and uh, Mr. Uh, Takatsuna and uh, Mrs. Uh, Soris, and of course, uh, Dr. Fetterman as well. Um, the question I, 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 I want to uh, add is that, uh, in fact, I think currently, uh, the, uh, the Mr. Uh, Nakatsusa, you, you mentioned the, uh, the auto uh, industry in China and you yourself also put a lot of investment in China. I think one very recent development in China is this uh, uh, clean energy, new energy, like electronic uh, vehicles. Uh, I just recall that a few weeks ago, Chinese government put up uh, a timetable for fully stop uh, the uh, uh, fissile uh, fuel sort of automobiles, which means it's potentially going to open a huge market for everyone. So, so I personally got that as also an area where potentially has a lot of uh, uh, potential, great potential for uh, China, Japan, and other partners coming together to uh, to collaborate. Uh, my question is: uh, is uh, the recently back in May, China held this Belt and Road uh, Summit, and uh, the Japan Japanese government sent a very senior delegation uh, to China. Uh, we do very much appreciate that. My question, uh, and also for Minister uh, Hayashi. Uh, and also uh, other panelists, and uh, Dr. Uh, Fenelman, if you want to join as well, is specifically, in your view, uh, how China and Japan uh, can cooperate, really generate uh, not only mutual benefit, but also providing more benefits globally. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much. And uh, actually, I'm the Secretary General of the uh, Parliamentary League for China-Japan Friendship. And I've been in China for almost uh, every year, and including the youth. I used to be youth, and, and, <laughs> and visited China as a youth trip and meet your younger leaders, and found out that uh, it's really, you know, they're trying to change the system and, and trying to have an innovation. And actually, partly, like I said, the innovation is happening. So actually, it used to be for US and uh, Japanese companies, it's a market versus markets and labor supply in China. So, but now uh, it's really the, the joint partners to make uh, innovations. And at the same level, we could talk about the science and technology and education at the si same level. So that's why uh, the important thing is to realize that we are different. When we think and talk with Chinese people or Korean people, our face is really similar, so that sometimes we feel we are the same, you know, uh, but uh, the background is different and culture is actually different. So always reminding us that we are partly different. So that's one very important thing. And also another important thing is the, uh, you know, sustainable society in China is really the key concern for Japanese companies who are investing into China. Because the, uh, maybe every 10 years, some turmoil happens and demonstration against Japanese shops or other shops, so that the, that is the political risk still in China. So how to make 
that kind of things are not to be repeated and how to make the Japanese companies especially uh, convinced about the China is a safe place to make a more investment is the very important uh, uh, point for the future relationship. Nakatsuka-san, do you have any comments? I think the many, many areas we can collaborate. Technical transfer is, I think, the absolutely one of the areas. Um, you know, EV, I know Chinese aggressive plan to increase the you know, penetration of electric vehicle, but for your information, EV does not have transmission. So that will kill my business, by the way. <laughs> anyway, but you know, think, think about you know, small cities growing up in, Ch uh, in China. It's not just Shanghai, Tianjin, or Guangzhou. It's many, many small cities growing up significantly. So that if they need mobility, so I think ICE, internal combustion engines vehicle, which is running today, that demand will also continuously uh, you know, increase. So the, what we are thinking is how to localize our production or you know, engineering expertise in China, transferring some good technology that is a kind of monetized opportunities for Japanese, you know, engineering technical companies, you know, trying to, you know, uh, uh, make our you know, technical presence in China. So that's kind of win-win. China can grow uh, their own domestic, you know, engineering capabilities, while on the other hand, we are kind of monetizing, you know, our you know, historical you know, investment we made in Japan. So those are the areas I can think about, and the, I, I trust the EV will be, you know, flowing uh, in the future, but at the same time, the traditional, you know, uh, cut today for increasing mobility, that's going to be, you know, also a, you know, growth opportunity. So technical collaboration is my answer to you. Very quickly, Mira. Uh, yes, just two points on how to promote uh, China-Japan cooperation. Um, you know, Japan is the other country besides the United States that did not join the AIB. But I think that uh, now with some track record of the AIB, it has become a little bit clearer the standards that the bank is pursuing. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of co-financing with the ADB. And I think that Japan could uh, do more to support that. I think that would be a good uh, um, thing to pursue. And the other one is that it's, I think, striking that the three largest economies in Northeast Asia do not have a free trade agreement between the three of them. So I think bringing uh, to a conclusion, or at least some movement, because I don't think it's even moving, the China-Japan, uh, South Korea free trade agreement, and then uh, China stepping up and Japan stepping up on the regional comprehensive economic partnership would be tangible examples of cooperation. Thanks, and if I can make a quick comment, I have three words. Science, science, science. <laughs> That's what's going to make it work. Next question. Yes. My, my question is to uh, Amira-san. Uh, I'm from uh, Japanese Foreign Ministry, and uh, I have been covering, uh, I, I have been working on TPP before. And uh, uh, although you know we are uh, negotiating TPP 11, we, we still hope that the U.S. Uh, government will change its mind and come back to uh, TPP, or maybe change the name or you know, whatsoever. Um, you have pointed out you know, the number of problems associated with uh, bilateral trade deals and the danger of uh, U.S. being excluded you know, from uh, Asia-Pacific economic architecture. So you know, I kind of you know, wonder what is your recommendation for Japan or other uh, people who are supporting you know, free trade across Asia Pacific to, to do? Of course, you know, uh, implementation of uh, Japan-Australia FTA would ch you know, change uh, the, the opinions of U.S. beef farmers, uh, but there must be other things you know, that uh, we could do together. Uh, thank you, Shikata-san. Very good question. Uh, I think the first priority is to make sure that TPP 11, it can actually be TPP 5 or 6 to begin with, but that the project of TPP does not die. Uh, one of the reasons why international trade has slowed down, uh, it's not the main contributing factor, but certainly it's important, is that we have not had major liberalizing initiatives implemented. So, you know, I think if you think about potentially the United States returning, it's always going to be easier to return to a template that, you know, had the participation of the United States embeds, you know, uh, uh, these core principles that the United States believes about trade and investment liberalization. And the notion is that, and I think it's completely correct, the calculus is that you're playing the long game. 
because I do think you're going to have to be very patient with the United States uh, for a number of years. Um, and I do think that it's going to require mostly homework inside the United States. So first of all, don't let TPP uh, die. Then obviously uh, uh, make sure that the Americans begin to feel the pinch of exclusion in a friendly way, if you will, because you need the mobilization of the business community and uh, people in Congress to make the case. And then I think the most important thing, and that's something that Japan can do little about, but really goes as to that domestic homework. The way I, I, I diagnose the problem is that the United States has pursued globalization on the cheap. That means that we have increased our exposure to international trade, but we have actually cut back on the safety net. We have not invested in worker force development, in social mobility. And I, quite frankly, I don't see yet the political will to do this in the United States. I hope that the correction course takes place. And only then, I think, that we can have a more sustainable trade leadership. But in the meantime, this is a relay race, and I think it's the, chance, the, the, the moment where Japan carries the torch uh, for all of us. Very good. I think there was one here and then over here. Here first. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Hide Uzaki, the governor of Hiroshima Prefecture. Um, you know, I guess the, this trade includes uh, uh, services and, and, and labor and the workforce, etc. And we've been trying hard to attract people to work in Hiroshima. And we also, you know, we want to push the uh, free trade, but we are now facing this U.S. Uh, new policy. And, and taking this, um, you know, situation, uh, taking advantage of this situation, can we uh, think more about uh, uh, attracting brains? I mean, with this uh, Im uh, immigration policy changes, you know, we have more chances. And uh, one question for uh, Minister Hayashi is, you know, can we do more in policy-wise? And and question for Nakatsuka-san is, are you doing it? <laughs> can we take two questions? We only have two minutes yeah. left. One All more right. question before we start, oh. please. Yes. Yes. My question is to Dr. Solis and Mr. Hayashi. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I've been following TPP since it was first mentioned back in 2010-11, probably before that. Um, and, and obviously, to see the United States drop out of TPP was a big shock. I was, I was pretty surprised as well. But I did some background. I actually read the whole document, a lot of the paperwork on it. I actually read it. Um, one of the one of the problems that the U.S. Congress and the Senate came out was that it basically was revolving around the special rights law for foreign direct investments. Um, and that was one of the roadblockers, I mean, I'm sorry, that was one of the red flags and showstoppers that they actually put into place. Um, my question is, if you, and I understand what you mean when you say that you prefer not to um, enforce the pursuant, the pursuant of a bilateral trade agreement, Multilateral probably sounds better, and I think TPP still is worth pursuing too as well, um, because it actually opens the market for business model innovation and open innovation in other areas and everything. But I still want to, but I still want to question: even if we go with uh, multilateral agreements or even bilateral, whichever direction they want to go, the foreign direct investment law or the special rights law, those laws will still take in, take into context, okay? And they will play a key vital role as part of the negotiating. Um, how do we get around that, and and when what's the selling point behind that? Because because those are key because those are key areas, and he's, even Senator Elizabeth Warren, she was one of the one of the key showstoppers in this. So I was really surprised at how this um, transpired from last year. Thank you, Governor Yuzaki, and um, I have personally a same kind of. Uh, uh, feeling that this could be a chance. Um, actually, I checked with the cabinet office and they already started to do that kind of ease of the Japanese uh, immigrant regulation for very high-end people. And the preparation schedule, preparation timing for that personality is almost uh, some months or even some days. So I think, I, I really hope that that will uh, enacted soon. And also I found out that uh, in, in our ministry's WPI program, World Premier Institute, jointly joined by the uh, foreign uh, guest scholars, uh, celebrated 10 years anniversary yes, uh, just last week. And also last week also I attended the 20th 
anniversary of the media arts uh, meddling, uh, including uh, artists from all over the world. So we need to strengthen these kind of things and invite, you know, if you are the very talented people, you cannot come overnight. So maybe meddling and uh, staying here two weeks, and finally the e e easing these, all those uh, leg regulations to welcome those people, not only from the United States, but also from you know, other, other areas too. But this, this could be a really a chance time. And also FDI is a really important point for, uh, that's why we are not doing free trade actually, but what, what we are calling EPA, Economic Partnership Agreement, is not only the trade, but also includes all the rules, including FDI. Yeah. One small action company is doing. Mm -hmm. Our headquarters is in Fuji, Shizuoka area. Nobody wants to go abroad. Very you know, domestic the people don't speak English. So what I'm doing uh, now is what I call inbound globalization, mm -hmm. bringing some non-Japanese people, non-Japanese speaking people into Fuji. And I increased the number by 50, 50 people. I increased only this year. And they speak you know, in English, and they love Japan, going back to home countries and bringing more people into Japan. Small action, but that's what I, my company is doing now. Okay. Maria? It's a huge topic, um, but it's clearly true that I think what you're referring to is the ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, the fact that you would have arbitral panels that you know uh, private investors could bring a case in case there is a breach in the terms of a trade agreement. And that has become an extremely controversial and sensitive topic among many publics, not only the United States. Different countries are trying different solutions. The European Union, for example, has initiated an investment court. And they negotiated with Canada. Now Canada has brought it to the NAFTA talks. There's no chance that the United States would ever accept such a system. But nevertheless, that's one way in which you can tackle this. Um, I have a whole chapter in the book I just published where I review the empirical evidence on ISDS. By, f by, far, by far and large, uh, states win most of the cases. None of these cases can change domestic law, and compensation is actually cents on the dollar from whatever was requested. Now, there have been improvements over time. The system is not perfect, and I think that anything that can be done to ensure that public uh, 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 regulations are enshrined and that it, in private investors do not want to challenge them is the right direction to go. But this is obviously a very complex topic. Okay, thanks very much. I think we're three minutes over time, so we have to stop here. Let me thank you very much for uh, coming and thank our panelists for an excellent, excellent panel. Thank you so much. That was great.